All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker before lunch. Uh, Seychelle Voss is an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at MIT. Her lab investigates how genome organization and gene expression are physically uh, coupled across molecular scales. Uh, and I believe she has some very exciting data related to RNA pool too, which she'll be telling us about today. All right. Thank you so much, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me um, the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, my lab is really interested in understanding how transcription and genome organization are physically coupled. Um, and it's okay. It's, I'm glad there's excitement. So the last talk before lunch, we're almost there. Um, this, I think, is the only structural biology talk that we're going to have. Um, so I like atoms. I like seeing things at, at the molecular level. So um, it will be a little bit of a, a change. Um, there will be no condensates in uh, my talk today. I'm very sorry for that. Um, so my lab um, is interested in this very important question of how do we convert the information in DNA to proteins that will ultimately dictate the function of each cell in our body. So we have the exact same, basically, DNA sequence in almost every cell in our body. However, our cells have very different functions. And the first step of deciding what genes get expressed in what cells is the conversion of the information in DNA to RNA. And this is done by a set of beautiful enzymes called RNA polymerases um, that Ibrahim nicely uh, introduced for us. Um, the RNA polymerase that we're interested in studying is RNA polymerase 2. And this is the RNA polymerase in eukaryotic cells that primarily transcribes all of the mRNA molecules. So RNA polymerase 2 has been intensely studied for about the last 50 years. A lot of work has gone into understanding it biochemically and structurally, and uh, people in our field, more in the biochemical and the structural side, um, have largely ignored that uh, RNA polymerase II has to function in a very difficult and complex environment. And that's because this is a complicated thing to study. We're reductionists. We like to take problems from the bottom and build them up. It's very hard to study something so complex like the cellular nucleus. This is a really beautiful image from Claudia Shea's group that I, I love. She's stained the chromatin in, in the nucleus, and that's what these dark speckles correspond to, or nucleosomes that have uh, been stained. And you can see that the, the nuclear environment is extremely dense and complicated. And in this environment, RNA polymerase needs to actually navigate through the DNA and make the right DNA, or, sorry, RNA out of the, the DNA sequence. And at the same time, we need to retain this compactness in the chromatin. We need to make, retain this organization to really make sure that the right genes get transcribed in the right cells. And so this is a question that I'm fundamentally interested in. How do we actually coordinate this really conflicted thing? We need to keep our, our organization so the DNA retains its um, fidelity. And at the same time, we need to make sure we get the right RNA out of it. And so we can break down this problem into different scales. Um, I like to think about it at three different scales, um, a bit smaller than what we've been talking about this morning. At the very basic scale, I like to think about the underlying DNA sequence and how this is affecting transcription. And part of my talk will discuss a little bit about how sequence influences transcriptional pausing. At the intermediate scale, I like to think about how DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes or formed into nucleosomes. These uh, structures we talked about briefly in Ben's talk um, a few hours ago. Um, also, we have DNA forming supercoils, and these supercoils can also help organize the genome, um, and we talked a little bit about that today with uh, the talk from Yob. For me, global organization is at a pretty small level probably for most of you, but this is when we start forming loops in the genome, and how these loops can segregate our, our genome into active and inactive regions and really regulate what uh, gets transcribed. So we can look at this using multiple techniques, and you guys have been exposed to many of these already. Um, we have sequencing techniques that have given us a beautiful understanding of how transcription um, is regulated and also how our genome folds. And we now see a, a lot of these sequencing techniques coalescing to understand how these two processes really correspond to each other. We also have imaging. We've learned a lot about super resolution microscopy and other forms of light microscopy to look at these processes. My lab likes to use something um, a little bit shifted in, in the resolution range. We like to look at the more angstrom level to try to understand these processes. And so we use a combination of X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, and we're now starting to even use cryo-electron tomography, where we're trying to image actually the nucleus and uh, see in cells how exactly things are organized. Today's talk will focus more um, on this side, um, trying to understand how local and intermediate interactions in our genome regulate transcription. <laughs> 
And so I'm going to start with a local organization, and this is older work, um, but I think it's an important thing for us to think about um, and uh, a field that we need to uh, progress further in, and, and my lab is pursuing some topics in this. So we want to understand how sequence influences transcriptional pausing, and I first need to tell you a bit about transcription before I can bring up pausing. So, uh, yesterday, we heard a lot about transcription initiation. It's a really, really important process, but a lot of gene regulation happens after the polymerase has actually begun to transcribe. So polymerase forms at a, a promoter, forms this complex called the pre-initiation complex. And in multicellular eukaryotes, shortly after the polymerase begins to transcribe, it can undergo a phenomenon known, known as promoter proximal pausing. And this happens something between 25 and 100 nucleotides after the polymerase has initiated transcription. And this pausing is stabilized by two protein factors called DSIF and negative elongation factor. And when they bind the polymerase, they can stabilize it in this pause state on the order of minutes in cells. And up to about 70% of human genes appear to be controlled this way. So it's a pretty uh, common way of controlling gene expression. Eventually, you do want to make an mRNA product. That is the goal of transcription. So you need to get out of the pause. And so to do this, you use CDK9. Um, which is a component in the positive transcriptional elongation factor B, or PTEV-B complex, again, that Ibrahim yesterday discussed a little bit. And so PTEV-B phosphorylates polymerase, as well as DCEF and negative elongation factor, and this results in the conversion of this pause complex into an activated complex that can rapidly transcribe through chromatin. So why pause? It seems like a pretty counterintuitive thing to do. You spend a lot of time getting that polymerase to that right gene locus. You probably form a condensate to get it there. You get it out of it, you get transcription, and then you stop. It doesn't seem like a very illogical thing to do, but we see that it's happening um, quite frequently. It seems to be really important for controlling genes um, involved in processes like development or in response to stress like heat or um, immune responses. Um, and it's also used by viruses to help control their expression within our own genomes. So it's a pretty widely used way of gene expression regulation, um, and in particular into responses that we need to tune very finely. One of the reasons we think that pausing happens is so that we have pol 2 already loaded onto the gene, and when we need to respond to a, a stress stimulus, it's already there and we can already start transcribing the gene. The other reason we think that we use pausing to regulate gene expression is to keep the chromatin in that region open. So by having a, a polymerase actually parked on a gene, we see that heterochromatin is actually blocked from that particular genomic locus, which is pretty cool. So those are the two main reasons we think pausing is happening in order to help regulate gene expression. So um, I'm, again, a reductionist, and I wanted to understand what actually causes pausing? What's the molecular basis for pausing, and, and why does this happen? And there are two main things that regulate pausing. One of the things that regulates pausing is the actual underlying DNA sequence. And quite a lot of work has gone on in the last 10 years using uh, techniques like NetSeq, where we can really finally determine where the polymerase is on a gene to identify pausing sequences. And I'm showing you a sequence that Jonathan Weissman's lab and uh, Bob Landick's lab found in 2014 for E. coli RNA polymerase. And this is a pausing sequence that um, it's also found in the human genome and is also causing human polymerase to also pause. So it's a, it's a rather ubiquitous sequence, and it has some elements that really seem to regulate um, where all multi-subunit polymerases are stalling on genes. The other thing that can help regulate pausing are protein factors. And so um, I already introduced these two protein factors in, in mammals, uh, DSIF and NELF, um, that can help stabilize pausing. So, we like to look at pausing using biochemical assays, and so how we do this is we take RNA polymerase too, we purify it from pig thymus, and then we can load it onto a piece of uh, DNA with a fluorescently labeled RNA, which you can see here on this gel, and then we give the polymerase nucleotides, and it will extend that RNA, and we can see that RNA get extended by separating it on a denaturing gel. And so each one of these bands corresponds to an extension product, and this sequence has a pause um, sequence on it. And you can see here that the polymerase is pausing, but over time we get this full length product. And this is just with the polymerase alone. If we give the polymerase um, pausing factors, what we can see is that this pause band stays for a longer period of time, and it takes the polymerase more time to fully extend the RNA product on this template. So two things here, we have 
factors that are helping stabilize pausing and the underlying sequence, and they're working together in concert, really, to get the pause. So the field, for a long time, didn't understand at a, the molecular level of pausing. There was a lot of conflicting biochemical data from some very respectable biochemists who were doing fantastic work, and we didn't understand what was going on. And we really were lacking structural information to understand how pausing is, is actually influenced by factors and sequence. Um, and at the time, there were major problems for us, especially in mammals, to look at this. Uh, one of the major issues for us is that uh, we have not, to date, been able to crystallize a mammalian RNA polymerase II enzyme. We've crystallized the yeast enzyme hundreds of times. If you look in the PDB, lots of structures. That's great. But we haven't been able to crystallize the mammalian enzyme. Additionally, we needed to find a sequence where we could get a very stable pause so we could investigate it from a structural level. And so for the sequence side, we ended up using the HIV-1 sequence. HIV-1 has an extremely strong pause, one of the most well-characterized ones. And so this allowed us to form a complex that was very, very stable between the pausing factors and RNA polymerase II. The other thing that uh, we were able to, to do to overcome this crystallization issue is that cryo-EM became more readily available and we could actually start seeing atoms, which is something that uh, prior to about 2013, um, it was a technique referred to as blobology. So uh, I know that this is a super diverse audience and I'm just going to give a couple of slides just on cryo-EM so you guys understand the technique just quite briefly. So cryo-EM is a very cool technique because we can take proteins in solution and we can capture their different conformations in solution. In crystallography, we have our proteins packing against each other, and we usually only trap one state. In cryo-EM, we can trap many, many states, which is beautiful. We can get a lot of different um, information out of it. We put this onto a, a grid that's made out of a metal, and usually with some kind of support, either carbon or gold, and we apply our sample to it, we blot away the excess sample, and we rapidly freeze it in liquid ethane so that we get glass-like ice that we call vitreous ice. So it's basically, we can see through it. We then take this frozen grid, and we don't put it in this little microscope, we put it in this big beast back here, and we can then image our molecules um, at very high resolution at the angstrom level. So what is it, what's happening inside this microscope? So basically here we have our vitreous ice, we have our proteins frozen in the ice, and we take an electron beam, which then passes through the sample and gives us a 2D image of our molecules. So that's what's happening inside of this microscope. And we're taking hopefully thousands of images of our molecules. At this point, we usually get millions of images that we're taking, and we need to somehow take those single 2D images and turn it into a 3D structure. And cryo-EM, in single particle cryo-EM, is an averaging technique. So this is the data we get. This is the micrograph. Um, these little spots here actually correspond to little RNA polymerases. I know it doesn't look very amazing, but it is. <laughs> From this very grainy gray image, we're actually able to get, nowadays, easily under three angstrom resolution, which is incredible. So we take this uh, grainy image, I'm just gonna convert it into something a little bit easier. We have our proteins, <laughs> frozen on the grid, and each one of these spots can correspond to a different view of our protein in, in three-dimensional space. We take these views, we pick them from the, the micrograph, and then we classify them based on what they are, and then we average them. That's a really important thing to know that we're averaging things. And when we can average in 2D space and get these 2D class averages, and this is again an RNA polymerase, and then we can also um, average in 3D space to get a reconstruction of what the protein looks like in three-dimensional space. So this is what has allowed us to now answer a lot of questions about RNA polymerase and its regulation. I'm going to show you this local regulation that we have from pausing, but I'm also going to show you some brand new data we have at the intermediate scale on nucleosomes of understanding how um, they regulate polymerase function. So um, over Christmas, we were able to collect a cryo data set of the paused complex, probably my best Christmas present in my life still, um, was getting this structure after many, many years of not having it. Um, and we got lots of um, exciting insights into pausing. And today I'm only going to focus on the, the one element that I've brought up, which is the sequence and how that influences pausing. So um, this is RNA polymerase in the center, and the pausing factors are here shown in green and in uh, purple, blue, and, and orange. And so the one aspect that I'm going to focus on is the nucleic acid conformation in the active site of the polymerase. So, Normally, when polymerase is transcribing along a gene, 
the active site is going between two different conformations as individual nucleotides are being incorporated into the RNA. And those two states we refer to as the pre-translocated state and the post-translocated state. So what you're looking at right now is the active site of RNA polymerase II. This is the template DNA strand, and this is the nascent RNA strand. And what you can see is that this RNA is base paired with every base of our DNA. There's no space for an incoming nucleotide to come in. And so we call this the pre-translocated state. When the polymerase translocates the RNA-DNA hybrid, this reveals the next DNA base that is able to then base pair with an incoming nucleotide, which will then get incorporated into this nascent RNA. So this state, before we translate it, Kate, sorry, it's called pre-translocated. Once we have the base available for base pairing with a new um, NTP, it's called the post-translocated state. So that's typically what polymerase is doing. It's cycling between these two states, between pre- and post-translocated. We're just going to uh, watch a movie. This is not a molecular dynamics simulation. This is just a morph between two structures um, for the physicists out there. Um, and see what it does in a normal state, and then I'll show you what's happening in the pause state. So we're gonna zoom into the RNA polymerase II active site. Polymerase is in silver. Um, we have our template DNA in blue and our non-template DNA in uh, cyan. And our RNA is here in red. And right now we're going right where all the action happens in the center of the enzyme. And so we're going to get rid of the polymerase density and only look at the nucleic acids. So again here, template, non-template, and we're in the pre-translocated state. It translocates, we now have this new DNA base. An incoming um, NTP is going to come in, so we're in this post-translocated state, and this NTP can now get incorporated into um, our RNA. And this will return us to the pre-translocated state. So the polymerase is doing this thousands of times as it transcribes a gene, and that's what it does all day, which is great. But what happens at a pause site? What does the active site look at this pausing position? At the pausing position, we actually see a different state. We call this state the tilted state. And in the tilted state, the, so let's see if the mucus, the DNA um, is in a pre-translocated state, and the RNA is in a post-translocated state. So what you can see here is that the RNA and the DNA don't have a place for an incoming NTP to come in. It's blocked. And this tilted state helps pause the polymerase because it will have to actually rewind this entire hybrid back to this plus one position to then push it back to reveal the next space. So it's a pretty effective way of stalling the polymerase. What was very cool is when we saw this structure at the same time, um, the groups of Seth Darst and Bob Landick and Albert Voxelbaumer were looking at bacterial RNA polymerase and they were using a totally different sequence. Um, they were also looking at pausing and they see the exact same conformation of the nucleic acids in the active site which really indicates that this tilted state is underlying pausing, and essentially this sequence-based pausing. This is how um, the enzyme is able to see sequence, and that affects its ability to transcribe. I wanted to bring up one um, thing. I told you that in cryo-EM we get lots and lots of states, and this wasn't published in the paper, but it's still something that I find really exciting to talk about. So I told you polymerase is going through all these different states. And in our data, we actually see all three active site states. We see the pre-translocated state, we see the post-translocated state, we see the tilted state. What was very cool is that the tilted state, we only see in the particles when NELF is bound. We see tilted on its own, sometimes without NELF, but when NELF is bound, the tilted state is the only thing NELF is with at the same time. I hope that makes sense. So that was very cool because we can see that the factors and the sequence really result in this one state being selected for in, that, in the active site. So I'm just gonna finish um, this section by giving you our current model on what we think is happening in, in pausing. So we have polymerase coming in. It's go going to its promoter and it's going to initiate. We can then switch over into elongation where you have factors like DSF, DSIF binding. The polymerase gets to the pause site, it pauses, and we think that the tilted state is already adopted at, the, at this point. And when it's in this tilted state, and it's already transiently paused, NELF can then bind and really stabilize that pause for a longer period of time. And so that's our current model, is basically we already have from the sequence a, a, a pausing, a short-lived pause, and the factors really help enforce it to have a longer, a longer pause state. So um, I have a very talented postdoc in my lab, Roberto, who's now following up on this work. 
Um, in the past, we were only looking at pausing on a few sequences. Um, as biochemists, we only can pipette so much. And most of our work, we can only look at five or, if we're lucky, 10 sequences in a single uh, paper. And so he's developing now a massively parallel um, assay uh, where we can look at thousands of sequences simultaneously with our highly purified factors to really understand how sequence and factors are influencing pausing to give us a better understanding um, of, of what's happening. And if he's here, so if you guys are curious, please talk to him. OK, so now I'm going to move on um, to intermediate organization and show you guys some new data um, that we have on trying to understand how chromatin influences transcription. But I first need to introduce um, some more players. Um, so we have our pausing state that gets relieved by this PTEV-B kinase, and this allows the elongation factors like PATH, DSIF, and, and SP26 to bind um, the polymerase. Um, and a, a few years ago, um, we purified all of these elongation factors. These are highly purified proteins. They're full-length proteins, so they have all their IDRs, um, but we don't see them in our structures. They're there, but we didn't cut them off. Um, we purified these proteins, and then we set up uh, biochemical assays to really understand how they're affecting polymerase function. And so um, what we found, um, just a summary of this work, is that when we incubate RNA polymerase II with these elongation factors, we can really stimulate its activity. And so this is just uh, a gel um, here where we have the set of elongation factors. And what you can see is that the polymerase is much, much faster with these factors than by, its, by itself. Um, and so this was exciting for us because it was the first time in a test tube that we were getting rates that were going to physiological rates. Um, I don't know, how, if, as a biochemist, that's really a big deal. Um, <laughs> I don't know if all of you understand, but a lot of times when we isolate enzymes, we have nothing near what a, what a, what's happening inside the cell. And so we were finally able to do it by just having this subset of factors that we purified. And using this um, uh, setup, we were also able to solve the structure um, of this complex that we call the activated EC star complex. Um, and we were able to define how an allosteric interaction between this protein called RTF1 and an element in the polymerase active site called the bridge helix um, leads to this stimulation. Um, basically, we think um, that uh, this C-terminal interaction with the bridge helix is causing the bridge helix to bend at a faster rate. At least that's our current model. So it was exciting for us. We had um, a, a model finally for faster transcription. We could get uh, really quick elongation rates, and this really is going to set up the next part of my talk. So we, we now have these structures of paused and elongating um, complexes, but there's an elephant in the room. These are on linear DNA templates. All of the assays I've shown you have been done on linear DNA templates, and RNA polymerase is never going to encounter linear DNA, sadly. It's a beautiful substrate for it. It loves linear DNAs, but it's going to have to deal with chromatin. Chromatin is nasty, and it's hard, and it's hard for polymerase um, to transcribe through. So, of course, a, a lingering question always to us while we started these studies is, what about chromatin? What is it doing to the polymerase? How does it affect its activity, and how does it affect it in the context of these factors? And so a first effort to start to understand how chromatin influences transcription um, was this structure. Uh, this is RNA polymerase II from uh, yeast from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and this is a nucleosome. And this was four years of hard work to get this structure. And basically all we did was park polymerase right in front of a nucleosome. That is what this structure is, which was really big at that time. It was a, a very helpful for us, but we didn't know um, how polymerase was actually getting through this nucleosomal substrate. We didn't understand how elongation factors were affecting the polymerase on this substrate. And so we really wanted to delve a bit deeper and try to actually get polymerase to go through the nucleosome and understand. And the reason why this is an important question is the nucleosome is a very hard barrier for the polymerase. Um, to, to remove the DNA from the nucleosome, it takes about 12 to 14 kilocals of energy. That's a lot of energy. And the polymerase, it's a strong motor, but it's not that strong. And so how do we get over that um, barrier? The other reason that we were interested in how the polymerase deals with chromatin is that chromatin is also directly influenced by polymerase. Um, and so beautiful work done by Fred Winston's lab and others um, has shown that if we remove elongation factors from RNA polymerase too, we start actually losing nucleosomes in our gene bodies. And that's really bad. You know, why is that so bad? Um, Chromatin actually helps prevent polymerase from initiating from the wrong spot in the genome. If polymerase sees a nice nucleosome-free region, it's very promiscuous, it will go there, it will start transcribing. And so this can lead to a lot of RNAs that aren't appropriately um, 
needed to, to become transcribed. So we really need to have um, this discussion between chromatin and elongation factors to retain the chromatin, but also to help the polymerase pass through um, these nucleosomes. And so there's several different outcomes for chromatin during transcription. I just told you about the first one. One is we can start ejecting nucleosomes from our chromatin, and this is bad because we can start getting this cryptic transcription initiation and start making RNAs from parts of the genome that we don't necessarily want to be transcribed. Another thing that can happen to nucleosomes during transcription is that we can only lose part of the, the histone. So histones contain eight proteins. There are four histone proteins. And one of these histone proteins form a dimer called the H2A-HDB dimer. And this can be lost during transcription. And the last thing that can happen to nucleosomes during transcription is they actually can be retained. And so we can actually keep them on the template nearly at the same position where they started and so we don't lose them. And so today I'm going to tell you um, some very recent structural work that we've done where we've been able to capture H2A-HGB dimer loss during transcription and also where we've been able to visualize for the first time a nucleosome being retained on the DNA template. And uh, these are very exciting stories for us um, and I hope you guys find them also interesting. So, Using our biochemical assay, we wanted to first understand um, how polymerase transcribes through, through chromatin. And what I'm showing you here is very similar to the assay I showed you for pausing. We have a nucleosome with an RNA primer on it. We add polymerase, give it some nucleotides, and let it transcribe. And here, when we have a very pared down polymerase complex, what you see is that we have a lot of bands here, and these bands correspond to pausing sites in the nucleosome, and we don't really see any of our full length product being made. So the polymerase is having a very difficult time navigating through this nucleosome. What's really exciting, though, is that when we give it this cocktail of factors that I showed you before that make the polymerase super fast, it actually is able to make the full-length product. And we don't see all these pausing bands in, in the intermediate. We see a few, but it's much reduced compared to before, where it's really pausing the whole time. So by having these elongation factors, we're actually able to overcome the nucleosomal barrier and make this full-length product. So we wanted to know, in the context of these, uh, these factors, can we start investigating what's happening as the polymerase is going through the nucleosome, because we can actually do that now. Before, when we just had polymerase on its own, it would basically stall initially when it gets into the nucleosome and it was kind of over. So we wanted to get further in by using the aid of this, uh, these products, or sorry, of these elongation factors. And so if we add these elongation factors, we see basically three prominent pauses. One is a pause at this position, which we call plus one, and this corresponds to this first site the polymerase sees when it encounters the nucleosome. And then we see two other prominent pause sites, one at position 38, which is about four turns into the nucleosome, and then a final pause site here at plus 64, which is right before this uh, axis that we call the dyad axis right in the middle. So it's about halfway through the nucleosome. So we see these three major pause sites. The structure I showed you before is, is very close to this plus one pause, so we didn't really care too much about that. We didn't want to see polymerase paused uh, in front of a nucleosome. We wanted to really understand what was happening at these two positions. I'm going to show you our structural efforts to see both of these pausing um, states. And so um, I'm going to start with this plus 38 position. Um, we are doing active biochemical experiments to trap these states. So basically, we're letting the polymerase transcribe to this position. So what we do is we deplete the DNA sequence of adenosine in the template strand. And so basically, we will get transcription to a particular point. And so then it will stall when it reaches this plus 38 um, position. And I'm going to summarize the structure that we got from, plus 30, from this position with a movie. And so here we have RNA polymerase two. In these beautiful colors here are our transcription elongation factors, and this is a nucleosome. And the beginning of this movie is artistic rendering. Um, the final part of the movie is the actual structure we solved. So we have polymerase, and it's transcribing along quite happily, and it's going to get to the nucleosome, and it's going to slow down a bit, and it's going to keep on transcribing. And what we're going to see in a moment is that the H2A H2B dimer here is going to fall off. So it's going to come up. And this is the proximal HGH dimer, the one that's closest to the polymerase. And now the polymerase is going to transcribe a little bit further um, into this plus 38 position. And it transcribes. 
And now we're going to see the polymerase backtrack on the DNA. And so the polymerase now is moving backwards on the DNA template, and the RNA that it just recreated is being extruded through this uh, region of the polymerase we call the pore in the funnel. And so this is the structure we solved. So this structure, we're lacking the H2A, H2B dimer, and we see this RNA, this backtracked RNA that's extruded through um, the funnel of the polymerase. We don't know when exactly in the transcription process we lost H2A, H2B. Um, unfortunately, we don't have particles um, where we actually get to the plus 42 state. It seems like most of them have backtracked. And so just as like a still image, this is the, the structure again, where we were lacking this H2A, H2B dimer. And this has been reported in the past that transcription can result in the loss of H2A, H2B. This is the first time at three angstrom resolution we're seeing that loss, and we're also seeing this backtracking. So I told you the polymerase has a hard time transcribing through chromatin. A lot of times when polymerase has a hard time transcribing, it moves backwards, and then it needs to go again. And so for those of you out there who are polymerase aficionados, when polymerase backtracks like this, it actually needs the help of a friend to start transcribing again. It can't just go again. And that friend um, is called TF2S, and TF2S helps the polymerase uh, endonucleus activity to be stimulated so it can cleave the RNA and then continue. And so we're just gonna watch a little bit more in this video. Um, now TF2S is going to come in, and it's going to, to bind and help stimulate cleavage of the RNA, and now the polymerase can continue on with its life and uh, try to get through the nucleosome again, try to get through this hexamer. And so we also solved the structure um, of uh, mammalian pole 2 with TF2S. Um, it's very similar to the use structure for anyone who's familiar with that work. But this is our current model for what's going on here. So polymerase has encountered a barrier, it's backtracked, we have to cleave the RNA and we can try again. And who knows how many times it gets through that. This structure, I don't know how, how often it happens inside cells, but clearly it does. Um, but the next thing I'm going to show you I think is probably happening more frequently than this state. But this is one thing that can happen to nucleosomes. They can be slightly disassembled from the transcriptional process. So the next state we want to talk about is what happens at plus 64. So this band on our gel is much brighter than this band at plus 38 that we just talked about where we have major pausing. And so we were curious, is this a different state? Are we going to see the polymerase backtracking? Are we going to see this disassembly of the nucleosome again or something, something else? And the answer is we're going to see something else. Um, and to, to do this, we teamed up with the lab of Lukas Farnung um, and worked with his talented postdoc, Martin Filipovsky. And again, this is an active process that we're looking at. So we've, again, installed um, a specific stall site here by depleting adenosine in our, in our DNA. We let the polymerase transcribe, and you can see even after half a minute, we already are basically getting our, our full-length products here. Um, we have a pause site at 38, at 54, and 64. And we take this actively transcribing product, purify it, and put it onto cryo-EM grids. And when we put this on a cryo-EM grid and we solved the structure, we were shocked. Um, we were not expecting this result, but I'll show you what our, our shocking result was. So we solved the structure to three angstrom resolution, so we can actually see from the bases the exact sequence of where the polymerase is. So we know our purines and pyrimidines by density, sequencing by density. It's a very expensive sequencing experiment, but it works because we have such high resolution. So uh, we have our elongation factors again here in colors, and we're going to go over to the, the side of the polymerase that we call the upstream side. And so the upstream side is the side of the polymerase where um, the DNA that's already been transcribed is coming out of the polymerase, okay? So this is the upstream DNA here in uh, light blue. And this uh, darker blue uh, DNA is the polymerase, or sorry, is the DNA that the polymerase still needs to transcribe. So what was really shocking to us is that we saw this upstream DNA coming out of the polymerase and rewrapping around the nucleosome. We weren't anticipating seeing this. This DNA is severely bent. Um, it's like almost a 90 degree bend. Um, from my understanding of, of uh, DNA and persistence length from, from Carlos Bustamante back from my PhD days at Berkeley, I, I didn't think that DNA could do this kind of thing, but it clearly can. It can, it can bend back on itself. So I'm gonna show you this in a little bit more detail. So this, again, is our already transcribed DNA. It's coming back and it's rewrapping the nucleosome. And so we have a, a movie here to kind of show you how that's going on. This DNA comes out of the polymerase and it comes back and it rewraps in the nucleosome. And 
again, we were shocked to be able to see this and to be able to capture this by, by cryo -EM. Okay, one last time just to, to make the point here. So, one of the things here that we see, um, sorry, is that one part of the elongation complex that is usually bound on the upstream side of the DNA called DSIF, it actually has to fall off in order for this DNA to come back. So in all the other structures that we've solved of elongation complexes, this regions of DSIF, which is called the NGN domain, it's conserved from bacteria to humans, is always bound along this upstream side of the DNA. And what we're seeing is that in order for this rewrapping to happen, this domain has to be displaced, and then this allows for the DNA to then come back and rewrap around the nucleosome to help retain it. And so we're seeing that this process is very dynamic. Um, it's not uh, a static thing. We like to draw nucleosomes, we like to draw polymerases, a lot of static, but I think by having our, our actively transcribing uh, complex and having this as a, an active biochemical process, we're actually able to capture a lot of dynamics that we wouldn't have been able to anticipate otherwise, which again is, is really, really exciting. The other thing that we're seeing is that the nucleosome doesn't have a, a canonical confirmation that we'd expect. I already mentioned this a bit. We see that the DNA is highly bent. So this is the DNA actually that's inside of the polymerase active site, and you can see that we have about 120 degree bend here in the DNA going back to the nucleosome. And this is the DNA that's coming back and rewrapping around um, the nucleosome. And this is our canonical structure um, of the nucleosome that was solved uh, by Carolyn Luger back in the late 90s. And so this, this process is really changing. Um, transcription is a very disruptive process, but it also can um, result in, a, in the chromatin then being uh, retained on the DNA, and so we're not losing our, our nucleosomes. And I think this really provides our first um, angstrom-level view of this process. Um, there was a lot of biochemistry that was done before, and this actually gives us a direct insight in how uh, we can actually physically retain a nucleosome on chromatin during transcription. So just as a summary here, um, we have RNA polymerase II entering on the nucleosome. We have the upstream DNA emerging from the polymerase as it's transcribing. And once the, we think the polymerase has passed the plus 38 position and the H2A, H2B dimer um, is revealed, this DNA then can come back and rewrap around um, the nucleosome. I didn't mention this earlier, but the structure that I showed you is not at plus 64. We're seeing this actually at plus 54, so 10 bases before our stall site is actually where the polymerase has stalled. Um, and, and that seems to be the spot at which we have this upstream DNA that can then come around and rewrap the nucleosome. So just because we had in our biochemical system a very defined stall, the more stable position and where we see this pausing again is plus 54. So again, having this active system is giving us a lot of information that I don't think we would have gotten from having a static system and a lot of surprises. And so again, here at plus 54, we now start seeing the rewrapping. And then what we think is happening if the polymerase transcribes a bit further, probably past the 64 site, we'll see a handover of the nucleosome from this downstream side to the upstream side. And that's where it will now get placed. And so that's, of course, um, the next thing that's exciting to pursue is how does that nucleosome actually get handed from one side of the polymerase to the other. And one thing that uh, this model can help us start thinking about is how nucleosomes are actually getting modified co-transcriptionally. So um, we know that a lot of uh, active modifications seem to happen at the same time um, that transcription is happening. And with our structures now of activated elongation complex as well as these new nucleosome complexes, we can start thinking about how these modification enzymes are interacting both with the nucleosome and with the polymerase. And so one of the models that we have right now involves one of the proteins that's called RTF1. RTF1 binds quite a few enzymes that are involved in either methylation or in ubiquitinylation of, of nucleosomes. Um, and what we posit right now is a potential model for marking already transcribed nucleosomes is that basically by having this protein RTF1 sitting on the upstream side, this would preferentially cause nucleosomes that were already transcribed to be post-translationally marked. This would be a really beautiful way for the cell to make sure that active marks were only deposited after the polymerase actually had passed through. We don't know if this is true, but it is our current model um, and a way of thinking forward on, on how these processes of epigenetic modification and nucleosome retention are, are linked to each other. Um, 
And so with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Um, I'd like to thank our collaborators, um, Lucas Farnung and Martin Filipowski at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, the work I showed you on H2H2Bs, -H2 the last story from my postdoc, it seems like it's gone on for a very long time, but with uh, Patrick Commerce Group um, and at the Max Planck Institute in, in Göttingen, Germany. Um, I'd like to thank my lab and all of these sources for funding our research, and again, thank you to all of you. I have an ignorant question. What, yeah. what is the force that wraps the DNA around at such short, short length scales? I don't know exactly. Like, I know it's possible, so there are, there's data to suggest that at, at local short scales, you can kind of break the persistence length rules, um, and that's, that's basically what's happening there. And it's apparently stable enough, uh, or it's super stable, otherwise we wouldn't see it in cryo-EM, uh, because we can only get the most stable states right now. But, how exactly, again, this was a surprise for me. I just, when we were talking about this for years, like I guess like the last six years, I didn't think that the DNA could do this, and it does. So that's why it's sometimes good to solve structures, because you can theorize about it all the time, like it's not gonna happen, and then it, it does. Back, back here. Um, yeah. In the cryium of the nucleosome, the, the first part that you showed, you classified the structures as is done in the game into six classes, I think you showed us, right? Um, and then subsequently you said this is uh, pre-translocation post and this is the uh, post state. How do you decide that even though you have many more classes than yeah, so we actually had a lot more classes. I just showed you a, a representative sampling. We do a lot of classification. Yeah. So what we did with that particular structure is we can do, make a thing called a mask, where we specifically say we only want to look at the density in the active site of pole 2. And so that's what we did is we took all of our particles, we made a mask around the nucleic acid, and then we could actually sort out the different conformations. And then when we did that, we saw that all of our NELF particles were basically sorting into this pre-translocated state. We also had states where like NELF wasn't bound, um, but it's, it's just a, a computational trick we basically but, use. But the pause state is a bit more dynamic, right? So, I mean, the, the post and the uh, uh, pre, I, I can understand, but how did, the, the more dynamic state, you must have some other uh, way in which you figured out, yeah, this tilted state or whatever it is, is the pause state, right? Well, I mean, we saw the null factor was only bound in that state. Uh -huh. So that was a really good indication that that was the paused state. Um, when we first solved the structure, we saw that there was not clear density for the DNA in the active site because there's so much motion. And we, that was a huge surprise because every other structure we solved it was either in the pre-translocated state or the post-translocated state, and now it was messy. And I initially thought that I ordered the wrong DNA from IDT and I screwed up the sequence and it was like not base pairing properly. That was what I initially thought. But then once we did really careful classification, it became clear that the tilted state was there and it was extremely stable once you had an elf. So I think it was really this having the right sequence and having the factor there that finally allowed us to capture that state. May I ask you one other small question? You didn't talk about this, but you did say it pauses for some time. But if I did single molecule experiments, is a pause is a pause state broadly distributed, or is it? Is it What's the story there? <laughs> no, it's a great question. So it's really dependent on the sequence, and it is a distribution. It's not one set of time. You can even see that from our gel analysis. Some of the polymerases escape, they make the full product. Other ones hang out for a while before they go on and make the, the full product. And so it is a distribution, and I think the sequence really plays a big role into how long that lasts, and then also what factors are, are around. But it's, it's not just one amount of time. Yeah, thank you. So probably it's a naive question as well, but uh, uh, these are reconstituted uh, nucleosomes, right? Yes. Okay, so as far, as far as I remember, normally you use specific sequences to be able to be stretched around the nucleosome, so you cannot just use any DNA to form nucleosomes in vitro. So do you think that this is somehow why the DNA can bend this 90 degrees, so it's like because of the, the DNA that you use for the nucleosome, or it's just like any DNA can be wrapped up around nucleosomes? No, that's a great question. So uh, yes, in the field right now, we are using sequences that will give us very phased 
orientations of the DNA on the nucleosome. And for structural biology, we absolutely need that right now. Otherwise, we're going to end up with the DNA being bound in many different states, and our sequencing by cryoEM won't work anymore. Um, so we're using a sequence called the WIDM601 sequence, which is very commonly, commonly used. Um, I think that we're gonna see the same thing on other sequences. Um, we're trying, Roberto, that's one of the things that he's trying is to look at putting nucleosomes on our templates and looking at how that affects you know, pausing and other things. But also for cryoEM, that's one of the things that we definitely want to start pursuing. But um, this is, it's these, I can't stress enough, this has been a hard journey to get these complexes. They're really dynamic, um, they're beasts. Um, and so we're happy already to have in this very defined system to see this, and I think now we have to, to start adding this additional complication of other DNAs. But I, my guess is we're gonna see the exact same confirmation. Yeah. I wonder if you could speculate at all about how this may or may not be related to uh, you know, when the polymerase encounters a difficult to replicate sequence or difficult to transcribe sequence or a damaged DNA um, you know, as it is bringing in repair factors and more even engaged in, in bypass itself. Um, you know, what do you now know different uh, about these larger complexes that you know, weren't evident from the um, early studies of the, the core itself? And do you mean like you have mostly in like repair complexes or in the context also of adding a nucleosome? Yeah, I, I guess both, right? I mean, direct bypass, right? Which I guess there's conflicting data, right? I think yeah, you know, yeah, in vitro yeah. it didn't, didn't look good, but in vivo people thought maybe uh, it could happen. Yeah, so. no, I, I think, I mean, there's, from Patrick's lab, there's been some beautiful work recently looking at um, transcription and coupled repair where you have like a, a cisplatin, for example, incorporated into the DNA. Um, and, and they've captured it now in multiple states where the polymerase gets pushed over the lesion if you have like CSV present, that kind of thing. Um, of course, that's the next thing is now to like think about how does that all work in the context of a chromatin mm -hmm. context, because uh, mm -hmm. that's again what the polymerase will see. And right. We haven't done that yet. And to what degree do those complexes mimic, you know, at the stall, does it look like the pause complex that you see, or is it a totally different? No, it's a different, it's a different state. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, depending on what drug and things you use, they have different states. So this tilted state um, really seems to be found like with, with the, pr these pausing sequences, that seems to be very common. It was seen before in some um, backtracked complexes um, where you had TF2S present. Um, we, in our backtrack complex here, don't see it tilted. So, um, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask what's so special about this plus 38 pause site only four turns into the nucleosome? Because my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the DNA has a 10 and a half base pair preference for um, wrapping around um, the histone proteins. So, so why pause at you know, only four turns in? And then a related question to that is, do you think that this structure at the plus 54 site the ability to see that on unwrapped DNA has anything to do with this 10 and a half base pair sequence um, preference? Yeah, okay, so I'll take the first question first. So we don't know why the polymerase pauses. I can explain maybe why we think it's doing it, but it, people have seen this before. So Carlos Bustamante has done beautiful single molecule work where he's been able to show that really on this proximal side of the nucleosome, you have a ton of pause sites, but then once you pass through the dyad, the polymerase really just doesn't care anymore, and it's just able to continue transcribing. And he, this was one of the sites he defined in a paper already in like 2019 where they, they know this is a defined site. What we're beginning to think is that these pausing sites might actually be a way for the polymerase to have certain factors come on and off. So we're thinking of the nucleosome as being far more dynamic than what we thought about it in the past, is basically um, there's a chaperone called FACT that some of you probably have heard about. Um, it actually needs the nucleosome to be partially unraveled to start binding. And so this plus 38 state, maybe that's when it fact pops on to the nucleosome to help stabilize the dimer before you have the rewrapping coming on. Um, and so by having maybe these defined states, this can help regulate which factors are present um, at what time. We also see that SPT45, for example, we see that part of it's rewrapping the nucleosome, um, and then apparently at this plus 54 state, it's becoming um, displaced. This 10 and a half base pair, um, yeah, periodicity basically in, in how it's wrapping. Um, we don't know how that plays into these pausing sites right now, um, but it's a, it's a great question, obviously something we need to think about more. Uh, so um, in the backtracked complex, you showed there were a few subunits that you didn't really tell us about. Yes, sorry. <laughs> C CTR9 and CDR. Yes. You, are, those, are those different proteins, separate proteins? Yeah, they're separate proteins. So they're part of a complex that's near and dear to my heart called the PATH complex. Um, CTR9 um, is the largest subunit in that complex. 
And it's the one that has this beautiful 100 angstrom long helix that's extending from one side to the other side. Um, it also has a long IDR at the C terminus, <laughs> if anybody's curious. Um, so that's an elongation factor. It's an elongation yeah. factor, exactly. We don't see a direct interaction between CTR9 and, and TF2S, um, but we're, we don't see the first domain of TF2S, and no one has seen domain one of TF2S in, in any structure so far. I had a second question. There was a biochemical paper from Dylan Todges uh, showing that the subunits of TF2D uh, could, uh, could elite, uh, relieve pausing. So in hindsight, is an explanation for those results that they're somehow preventing the tilted state? That would be the, the guess that we'd have. Um, I don't know, TF2D is a massive complex and it's interacting with you know, different sequence elements depending on the promoter. Um, I don't think it would be interacting with the elongating polymerase. I think it's maybe stuck at the um, promoter and then it's somehow interacting. Um, it's something we need to explore, but my guess is in his results, yeah, one explanation would be is that it's helping somehow the tilted state be more short-lived in promoting yeah, elongation. Uh, fabulous work. So um, I'm curious about, did you observe any sliding of these nuclear cell sequences during your experiment? Because you are using the 601, so I guess like uh, in a more native setting, it will be more easier for it to slide. But I'm just curious, in your experiment, did you see any sliding which supposedly can expose these uh, nucleosomal DNA for its transcription? No, that's a great question. So yeah, because the 601 sequence is so stable, we see it's very, very well positioned and we see basically no differences in, in our nucleosomes. Um, and you're right, if we use um, native sequences, there probably will be more sliding and, and more movement. Um, but I still think a lot of these principles that we're uncovering with this more defined system will probably remain the same. And the pause sites probably are also the, the same. You can even flip the orientation of the sequences and a lot of those sequen pauses remain. Um, so I think it's more a fundamental issue of the uh, hydrogen bonds that you have to break with the DNA backbone and the, um, the histone proteins that are, are more fundamental towards this behavior. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I had, I had a question about your, um, so in your reconstituted system, I presume you're using linear pieces of DNA even with or without nucleosomes? Yes, we're not doing this on plasmids right now. So that's what my question yes. is. Have you thought about, or do you think it's interesting to do, to see how DNA twist plays a role in, you know, in yes. the stability of these states? Yes, yes, yes. It's something that I'm very much interested in. So full disclosure, I did my PhD with James Berger. I studied topoisomerases as a, as a PhD student. So I have a deep love for DNA topology. Um, this system is hard right now for us to do, incorporate that. Um, right now, we have to play a trick where we have a DNA primer, or sorry, an RNA primer that we're annealing to the DNA. And so in a plasmid system, that's a little bit more complicated to do. Um, I have some ideas on how we can, can manage that, but to get these elongation states, that's currently how we're doing it. Um, but we do need to go into adding in the, the topology and how that's affecting um, polymerase activity and nucleosome stability, that kind of thing. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? I think everyone's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's lunch. thank Seychelles one more time. <clears throat>